Well, welcome everyone. So nice to see people, even though you're masked. It'd be nicer to see your faces. Um, I want to thank you all for coming, um, for joining us in this beautiful chapel, in this beautiful property, and um, celebrating seven years of Joseph's house. Um, it's so appropriate what Father spoke of in his homily about the trust of St. Joseph because he's a faith-filled man. And anything you read about him, whether it's in the office or the daily readings or through the saints, you hear about his faith. He didn't have a spiritual director to go to. He didn't have anyone to talk to when the dreams came to him in the middle of the night. He just acted. He stepped out in faith. And faith is what built Joseph's house. Um, from day one, it's been a faith-filled mission. Um, it's just been one foot in front of the other, and the people came. Maria came, Barry came. I see so many faces here um, who have contributed to this mission in so many ways. It, it really, um, it warms my heart. And I want you to know um, St. Joseph is the reason there is a Joseph's house. There's a reason we are in this monastery which we're going to try to call a sanctuary, if we can ever stop saying monastery. <laughs> um, and after nearly seven years of assisting all these homeless pregnant women and our young moms, we've come to learn that our dreams for the future can never be bigger than those that God has. And as long as we follow the inspirations and ask for the intercession of St. Joseph, we're not going to have any problems. We'll continue to grow. We'll continue, continue to strengthen. We'll continue to find the people who need our home to change their lives and succeed. We are about the dignity of women and the sanctity of human life. And that is why we are so blessed. Um, we couldn't do it without all of you. We have a tremendous staff that works day in, day out, hard, very hard lots of hours, um, giving their all for all these moms and all the kids. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Bronson, who's going to give you our vision for the future. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's a real privilege to uh, be here today on such a joyous occasion. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. And a very happy St. Joseph's Day in the year of St. Joseph. I want to thank you all for joining us, particularly those joining us via live stream or who will watch this later. As I mentioned, as Kitty mentioned, uh, my name is Bronson Kopp and I have the privilege of serving as the executive director of Joseph's House. Today we celebrate the feast of St. Joseph, the earthly father, protector, guardian of the child Jesus, our patron, our intercessor. Today, we celebrate the more than 150 women who have come to find refuge under the roof of Joseph's house. The countless children, and particularly the at least 60 babies who have been born and saved that call Joseph's house their first home. We celebrate those who came before us, paving this path with their prayers, their tears, their sweat, and the love that they put forth to bring this mission of life to life. Today, we also celebrate the cloistered Dominican sisters who, for 91 years, were ardent, faithful prayer warriors on the north side of Syracuse in this very building. This monastery began, from the best we can tell from the records, on March 25th, 1925, the Feast of the Annunciation. And just one year ago today, the closing mass was held and the Dominican monastery was closed. While we celebrate the seventh anniversary of Joseph's house, we also celebrate the beginning of the next chapter in this life-saving mission. Before I talk about the future, I want to take a quick look back and celebrate the amazing accomplishments of the last seven years. In the past seven years, a large house was purchased, became a home, a home where no judgment was passed, but love and support was offered, a home founded in the love of Christ for those who had nowhere to go. Those whose circumstances put them in the ranks among, in the least among us. 
A house that became a home that became a family. A family for those who needed it. A family for those who never had it. A family that extended a hand of support. A family who felt they had nowhere else to turn and their only option may be to terminate their pregnancy. For this was often maybe the only way that they could save themselves from homelessness, from exile and shame from their families, from a host of other injury and challenge. Instead of shame and scorn, they got support. They got spiritual guidance. They got prayer. They got direction and purpose. They got accountability and responsibility. They got tutoring, parenting aids, mentors, advocates. They got friends. They got love. They got purpose. And they got their right. I'd be remiss if I didn't recognize all those that put so much into this and continue to do so today. Kitty Spinelli, Maria Miller, Barry Vaughn, Father Pryor, Todd and Amy Caputo, Tammy Anthony, Chuck and Nancy Cometti, Tom and Leah Valenti, and so many more. Most importantly, our staff, many of whom have been with us since the very first day. They are the true frontline essential heroes, right? They are the hands and feet demonstrating the love of Christ to our residents each and every day. You are all true and faithful servants who have paved this path and continue to pave the way to God's kingdom to those for those we serve at Joseph's House. My sincere gratitude for your faithful service, your advice and counsel, and like Mary at the Annunciation, thank you for saying yes to create this beacon of life in central New York. I want to reflect for a brief moment on the last two years and where they have taken us. In early 2019, many of the staff, Kitty and I, we had a morning-long retreat at Joseph's house. We had been struggling with this feeling of letdown. We had a few residents that had stayed with us for a short period of time, had moved on. They kind of used us as a stopgap measure. They left before we knew they were ready. We had heartache, disappointment, this missed opportunity. So that morning, that retreat, we had flip chart paper put up on the wall all around the dining room. We talked about what our dreams and desires were for the residents and their children. We had a page for wellness, idea about new spaces and programs, fitness classes, nutrition, trauma healing, recovery for addiction. We talked about mental health, having a therapist on staff, support groups, meetings, providing a place and a, spa excuse me, and a space for healing. We talked about the need to do more to give them the skills they needed for success. Classes in finance and budgeting, the need for better GED preparatory materials, tutors. We talked about the need to help our residents find a place of peace and a place of belonging. Space for group cooking classes, nutrition classes. We wanted to truly build a community among our residents while they were at the house, but also those that we serve as they transition out into our Exodus program. We dreamed, quite honestly, and we dreamed big. I remember imploring the staff, think of the times where we've said, oh, I just wish we had this. Or if we could only do this, maybe we could have broken through. Maybe we could have done more to help them. Whatever that limitation was, ultimately became a wish list that turned into a plan. And as you'll see, is becoming a reality despite even the challenges of the pandemic. We quickly realized that our dreams had outpaced the size of our current space we had at Joseph's house. You see, the mission is one of life, and despite sometimes the constant rhetoric, you've heard it before, right? You don't, you're not pro-life, you don't care about education, you don't care about health care, you don't want to take care of them after, you're only pro-birth. Well, at Joseph's house, we are truly and unabashedly pro-life. The life and dignity of the women and the precious sacredness of the child, both born and unborn. And to be so fully pro-life, and to be so desirous to truly impact who they are, we needed a place to grow. Not long after this morning retreat, we were invited to apply for a regional grant from the Mother Cabrini Health Foundation. Parent that this opportunity before us was kind of a divine collision course of our dreams and the potential source to make them happen. When we applied for this grant, we didn't have a space in mind, but we had applied contemplating that Joseph's House needed a place where our community could come together 
current residents and former residents where they could be continually enriched. In the summer of 2019, we learned that the Dominican sisters, who for 91 years had called this monastery home, were closing. As we've known from our first residents, former monasteries and convents don't lend themselves to a lot of commercial purposes. However, they offer enormous opportunity for an organization like ours. As we got to know our dear friend, Sister Anna Marie Pierre, the prioress who is in charge of closing this down, who I hope is joining us via live stream today, we had the opportunity to tour the facility and we quickly became excited and interested in the enormous potential that this had when there are so many women in our community in need. And discerning the purchase, again, it was a demonstration to us that every step along the way, that this is his mission. This isn't our mission. That this is his mission to save the babies and their mothers whose society has so badly devalued. And since this is his mission, his plans are much bigger and much more impactful than we could ever dream. We were awarded that regional grant from the Comperini Foundation with partial, partial funding to help grow our staff and programming in 2019 to be used in 2020 by adding essential life skills programming staff, GED tutors, a shuttle driver, a mental health counselor, and some of the funds necessary to help create that space. While our plan was to fill that programming space, his plan was a little bit bigger and envisioned us more than tripling our capacity over the next three to five years. Going from the capacity of up to 10 women at one time at one facility to potentially 25 to 30 women over two facilities. The expansion is not only in the number of clients that we may be able to serve, but also in the areas we can concentrate and focus. As many of you know, I previously practiced defense litigation, and I always like to say that our, our mission shouldn't be an insurance policy, right? There shouldn't be exclusions applying. We shouldn't say our motto is to first to save and then to serve these pregnant homeless women, but we can't do it if they're this. We can't do it if they struggle with addiction. We can't do it if they have a mental health crisis. We can't do it if they have other children. We've long said we seek to change lives, two generations at a time. When we talk about changing lives, we mean true transformation. When people ask, how do you do this, right? How do we get through to these women? How do we help them when their need is so great? Well, as Kitty has talked and Father has talked with the example of St. Joseph, we lean into our faith. We discern and we continue to walk through the doors as they open, remaining not only faith-based, but a faith-first organization. Our deep for our residents is that they reach a spiritual self-awareness, a metanoia, where they can see that God has a plan for their lives and they are capable of great things. Simple, simplest distillation of this could be summed up as transformation through consecration. Each act, no matter how small, is an act separating themselves from that which enslaves them, giving it to God. What we hope for is a conversion of the heart, but we recognize that when we say things like, first we save, then we serve, it's not us who saves. Only he can save. Only he can change hearts. Our job is to create an environment and the support necessary where the, the drama and the trauma can be extinguished so that conversion can happen. Picking up the phone and calling Joseph's house is a deep act of faith. It's a step forward in faith. While our residents may not even realize it, we believe that this simple act is an act influenced and orchestrated by the Holy Spirit. Each and every day, they allow themselves to remain at Joseph's house. Each day, they wake up and say yes to this process and yes to changing their lives is an act of consecration. But we can't expect everyone to be ready to jump into this transformation, right? Women come to us in chaos. They come to us in trauma. They come to us in crisis. We have to meet them where they're at. We have, to, we have identified a three-phased approach of stabilization, restoration, and transformation to focus and grow our programming. Stabilization is the putting out of the fire, right? We're trying to help meet basic human needs. They haven't had, they haven't had a meal. They need a warm bed to sleep in, a roof over their head. They need to escape the uh, threat of violence or abuse. Many of our residents are actively enduring trauma when they call us. How often do we hear when we meet somebody, can we get something to eat? I haven't eaten today. We can't seek true transformation without first helping to stabilize these situations. Restoration is probably the most difficult, but also the most important phase of this process. This is the process of healing, of deep personal change. 
Includes counseling for addiction, abuse, mental health issues. Includes the journey to forgiveness. Forgiveness of oneself. The forgiveness of others. It involves breaking, uh, excuse me, repairing those broken relationships. And developing new, healthy, supportive ones. It's also the process in which the resident needs courage. They need the grit and the grace to commit. And they must be willing to give themselves and the process over to his amazing grace. It's in this healing that our residents can begin to see themselves differently. And this goes for both our mothers and their children. How often do we think about the ways in which we talk to ourselves? How we talk to ourselves is often a reflection of how others have spoken of us. For the residents of Joseph's house, this often means really hurtful, degrading language. You're nothing. You can't have this child and succeed. You can't go to school. You won't get a job. You can't do it. The longer you hear that type of language, the more you start to believe it and talk to yourself that way. This is the cycle and the breakthrough that we truly hope we can see to break. For once we start to see ourselves as uniquely created in the image and likeness of God, we begin to realize our God-given gifts and potentials. The third essential phase is transformation. This work includes programming and services rooted in self-development, educational, vocational training, career counseling. But the ultimate transformation we seek is that transformation of mind and heart, giving oneself over to God and seeking his grace in pursuit of their potential. I often say the hardest question people ask us is, what don't we do at Joseph's house? It's challenging because when you're seeking to help someone truly transform their lives, there's not much you won't do. We've helped moms get driver's licenses, cars, degrees, laptops, apartments, houses, anything that stands in the way of their success. I believe this makes us uniquely positioned and uniquely comprehensive to address the dire need in the community. So why Joseph's house? I want to highlight some of the challenges facing the women that we serve today. I want to first talk about poverty. You can see from this graph, the orange lines represent women in specific age groups in our community who live below the poverty threshold. The highest two lines you see on there are women 18 to 34 years old. Data for the city of Syracuse in all five central New York counties reflect this phenomenon that women disproportionately make the face of poverty. Year after year, data shows more more women living in poverty than men. The highest rate is within women living excuse me, women 18 to 24. In 2018, nearly 29% of these women lived below the poverty threshold. This poverty threshold is pretty pathetic, right? This is pretty low. One third of women that age live below that. In Onondaga County, you can see that 30% of live births that were a result of unintended pregnancies. That rises to over 50% among non-Hispanic blacks. And maybe where we can see the direct correlation in what we do and in poverty in unintended pregnancy. Over 45% of live births that resulted from unintended pregnancies were Medicaid paid births, compared to just 17% for those not paid by Medicaid. It appears to be pretty evident that poverty is a factor, certainly, of unintended pregnancies in Onondaga County. I'd like to focus on teenage pregnancies for just one moment. Some of this information is not easy to hear, but in 2018, teenage pregnancies in Onondaga County alone, women 15 to 19 years old, 34% of those pregnancies resulted in abortion. That's 142 lives lost to potential teen moms in just our county in just one year. The news gets only more tragic when you look at the state where the rate among, uh, excuse me, the rate of abortion among teen moms is 47%. And most tragically, if you're an unborn child to a teen mom in New York City, it is more likely than not that you would be aborted, with 56% of teen pregnancies ending in abortion. This is an epidemic. When we talk about growing our programming and services to include women under 18 years old, you can see the need is truly great. Pair this with another ongoing challenge in our communities, the ongoing addiction crisis. As we know, opioid addiction has been ravaging our communities. The frequency of calls that we receive at Joseph's House follows this trend over the last 10 years, 
that show uh, an increase in use, uh, excuse me, an increase in self-reported illegal drug use among pregnant women. This is only the women that self-reported that illegal drug use. Onondaga County, 10% of women, excuse me, women in 2018 reported that. 17% in the city of Syracuse. There's many factors that, come, that all come into play here that lead uh, to these barriers to promoting healthy lives for women and their children. Poverty, shortage in affordable housing, specifically in family housing, lack of transportation, access to quality childcare, substance use and abuse, lack of awareness and a difficulty navigating these really complex systems. So where do we go from here? We double down, right? We steal our resolve and we go forward each day. We recommit to our vision to save pregnant homeless women and their children and prepare them to thrive in life thereafter. We act with prudence. We step out in courage. We give them hope. We teach them faith. We show them love. We promise wholehearted, unwavering service to mothers, children, and their families. While the pandemic has impacted our ability to fully implement that vision for the increased programming that was supported by Cabrini, particularly among our Exodus moms, we've begun to bring it to life. A mental health counselor has joined the staff, providing direct care to our residents, both in the home and in our Exodus program. While sometimes done virtually right now, this is offered at no charge and not dependent on any insurance policy or qualifications. We pay the counselor, our mothers and children get the service. We've established an art studio where our residents can unwind, breathe, heal, express themselves creatively, allowing themselves to dream again. We've painted boards for the Canvas Project in Syracuse Land Bank, bringing some beauty to our city. We'll begin implementing our art therapy program in the near future. We've set up a sewing lab to teach our moms what could be a side hobby or a craft or could become the development of a Joseph South enterprise, making and selling anything from baby blankets to masks to reusable grocery bags. You know, when we first started this, that was what we thought, oh, we, grocery bags, right? If you think back a year ago, that was the big ban of plastic grocery bags. Our life skills coordinators hosted, excuse me, hosted cultural outings, exercise programs, trauma healing classes, and so many more to a schedule that's only growing. We've done service projects at Matthew 25 Farm and other places where we help harvest vegetables for those in need. We've done family and seasonal outings like apple picking, trips to the pumpkin patch or the Syracuse Zoo. We've hosted cooking classes, nutrition classes for both our moms and our children. We were again invited last year to apply for the Cabrini Foundation grant, and I'm pleased to announce that we were blessed again with to date, what is the highest grant award in Joseph's House history to continue to expand our residential services? We've begun preparing and converting rooms. We're working diligently and methodically to train and grow our staff to prepare to house additional women and children, particularly those women who choose life and have nowhere to go. Our goal is to have the staff in place by the end of this year, pending our continued approvals with the government so that we can welcome our first moms under this roof. This grant will allow us to begin to hire the necessary staff positions, conduct staff development, and implement our strategic plan and program transformation through consecration. While being ever mindful of being good stewards of the precious resources we've been provided with, we try to keep our eye on the big picture. While we're focused on getting women housed in this building, we want to ensure that we're strategically building our programming so that we can see true transformation and that this bastion of life, this sanctuary is here for all those who need it, not just this year, not just next year, but 10 years from now and more. We're different. We're seeking to address root causes. We're seeking true transformation. This takes time. This takes courage. This takes grit and grace. But... Our dreams are big, his are bigger. Our goals are lofty, but his will is supreme. We wouldn't be able to do any of this if it weren't for all of you who are part of the Joseph's House family. Your financial support, your commitment to the sanctity of life and dignity of women, and most importantly, your prayers. 
The opportunity before us is immense. The need is great. And with your continued support, faithful, prayerful dedication to our mission, we're ensuring that there is always a place for a pregnant, homeless woman in Syracuse who chooses life for her sacred and precious child. Just as there was for the very first child to call Joseph's house home. St. Joseph, pray for us. Blessed Virgin Mary, pray for us. May God continue to bless you in this most important ministry. Thank you.